Libati, just by words, where I've come and cried for Imam Hussein, or I've listened to some majlises and I've walked out without having anything that has gone into my heart, but rather just stuck in my ear because it was supposed to be some tradition so that I can please my blessed Imam, that on the day of judgment my Imam will say, you sat in my majlis. To sit in a majlis is a ni'mah, it's a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To listen to the Qur'an is a ni'mah, to look at the Qur'an is a ni'mah. But brothers and sisters, let's be fair. There's a big difference between a person who just looks at the cover of the Qur'an versus the one who opens it and reads it and memorizes it and lives it. It's a big difference. Ask anybody. Ask a child, they'll tell you, of course. Why do we limit ourselves to such religion where we put ourselves in a cyclical order only to hold ourselves one way, thinking that we're going to get a shortcut into paradise? No. If shortcuts were available, I say to you in a very simplistic manner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful and He is benevolent. He would never allow His beloved messengers and prophets to suffer in this world. He'd say, if my believers can take shortcuts into my paradise that I created for them, why should I bother you when I've chosen you? If they can take it easy, why should you suffer when I love you most? No, that's not how it works. We are supposed to put it in action. And action means we need to look at these Imams, we need to look at these Prophets and say, how do I emulate them? You see, in my life, when I was growing up in the West, I made choices to follow the Western life first. I thought it looked good. And I thought it had the answers, because from the outward experience, it showed like everybody was having a good time. And after all, let's face it, every human being wants to be happy. Why are we here? Why are you here tonight in this majlis? Because you want to be happy. Why does a man pray? Because he wants to be happy. I know others may say other things, but the reason we do what we do, a reason a Christian goes to church, the reason the atheist says what he says, and the reason anybody says whatever they want, is because the ultimate goal that they have is to be happy. Allah says, the one who comes to me is really the happy one. Everybody else is fooling himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all the time in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows it is the believer who is happy. In Surah Al-Fatih, Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِيمَانًا مَعَ إِيمَانِهِمْ وَلِلَّهِ جُنُودُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَرَهِ He it is who puts tranquility into the hearts of the believers. هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He puts it into the hearts of the believers. Liyazdadu, therefore, he increases their iman upon their iman. Look at this. That means we become firmer in our faith. We get greater yaqeen. Then Allah says, "Thumma lam yirtabu wa jahadu bi amwalim inna al mu'minun al ladin amanu billahi wa rasooli." Thumma lam yirtabu. Then they don't doubt. You know when you read them, don't doubt. When your iman becomes increased. So happiness is that way. When I looked around and I thought that the Western life was right. I started to touch it a little bit. Alhamdulillah, not in the haram way, but in the material sense of the way. We all experience that. We are children. After all, even if we could be 60 years old, we still could be children, you know, in our spirits. We touch the material thinking, if only I possess this, and I caress it, and I hold it, maybe I'll be a happy man. When I look at my bank balance, and I see all the big zeros in it, I'll be a happy man. No. Never. <laughs> Those are tools Allah has given us. And certainly they can lead to happiness. But it depends on how you use those tools which will lead you to happiness. So if you possess a lot of money, it's a great gift of Allah. Oh sure. But when you part from it and give it to the poor who are mostly destitute and they are in need when their homes are breaking down and you go and save them, Allah says, this is my creature that I love. The one who I gave this ni'mah to, and rather than worrying for himself, he went looking in the dark of the night, looking for who the poor one was, so that he could bring a big smile into his face, and into the smile of that orphan, or that poor man, that today he was wondering who's going to feed him, but from the dark of the night, a true servant of Allah, who possessed the wealth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he went and gave it. That's the pleasure we need to derive from, but rather we become extremely selfish when money comes in our ways. We think, oh, if only I have another million, then maybe I'll give another thousand. And then another million, maybe I'll give another hundred. We think that way. Shaitan has us fooled. We become slaves of our own system. And I saw this happening to me in my life. That I looked at this material world, it was a passion. You thought that maybe this will bring me happiness. Maybe my looks, or maybe my clothes, or maybe my car, or maybe my house needs to be bigger. And in the assessment, I found that this is all fake. This is all lies. 
These are gifts of Allah, but these are not goals in my life. And I started to retrace myself and I said, wait a minute, something's wrong with me. I am lacking my own confidence. I am a victim of the society that pressures me to dress and look the way they want me to be. Not because they care for me, because they want to lie in their pockets. And I said, I can't be. I was listening to one majlis of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam. And I hear the story of Imam Hussain saying to Ibn Ziyad, and speaking of course to Umar ibn Asad and Yazid, Allah created me free. What, you want to put chains on me? Kill me. In kana deena Muhammadin, lam yastaqim illa biqatli, fa ya suyufu khudini, come. Ah, I said, subhanallah, that's my leader. That's the man I want to follow. Even Mahatma Gandhi noticed this one. Not a Muslim, he noticed this. When we as Shia of Ahl al-Bayt, when we revere our Imams, even the non-Muslims have taken reverence to them. That's a great honor, though we don't need non-Muslims to take reverence to them, because the truth is the truth, whether you like it or not. But truth speaks louder than words. For subhanAllah, even the non-Muslims are taking what we are holding. We should be greatly honored, therefore it is incumbent upon us, wajib upon us, not to sit around and just mention their names. But no, Imams will ask us on Judgment Day, we came as representatives for you, we gave our lives for you to teach you. What did you do with our lessons? Did you just mention it? That's it? You didn't curtail your tongue? You did not stop backbiting and gossiping? You didn't give charity? You were not humble? No, Imam, I was too busy. Imam says, what? That's why we came. So when I looked at that in my life, I retraced myself. I said, I'm a victim and I cannot allow this victimization. Absolutely not. I must take control of myself. But before I decided as to who I was going to put my lock on to follow, I assessed. I said, who should I follow? My friends? Let's see. What do they know? Do they know anything? Do they know where tomorrow lies? Do they know where they are? No. How about the rich man? Does he know? No. How about the poor man? No. No one knows. How about the judge, the teacher? No one knows. And as I went into the assessments, I realized it has to be from a divine source. Somebody who Allah has guaranteed for me such pleasure that when I turn my back on these personalities, which I'm going to put my life upon, they will protect me. You see, I give you an example. Who is the best person in your community? It's the one when he leaves you, he protects you. And when someone comes to backbite about you, he will say, I don't want to hear that. Because he becomes your mirror. That when he sees a scar on you, he hides you. He doesn't let anybody touch you. How many people do you know in this world that they are like that? But when you find them, even when they work for you, you know the honest ones who work for the people who have businesses, ask them, what's the price of that worker? The one who's holding all your money and he doesn't take even one dollar from you. Ask him. He said, this one's priceless. Why? Because he's got scruples, he's got morals, he's got somebody who's connecting him and he's afraid of the divine source. Well, if such a person can be so good, imagine our blessed prophet and imams. So I chose in my life, I said, I need to follow these personalities. Allah has blessed me and gifted me as a birth, in birth, with birth, as a Muslim, as a follower of Ahl al-Bayt, I need to submit. So see, it wasn't easy. I tell you the first line of resistance came from my own community. And I'm not putting down my community. But you all know what I mean. Boy, the day you start going towards Allah, everybody starts making fun of you. You look down upon. Why? Because you're not economically viable. Oh, you're going to talk about Allah and read Quran. <laughs> How much money are you going to make? That's their thinking. I said, you got it all wrong. We're not doing it for money. We don't need your money. We're doing it for self-respect. We're doing it to elevate our status that when humans meet us, they don't care about what clothes we're wearing or how much money we